Moving forward to tonight's program. First, I am thrilled to announce the launch of the Mar Maritime Distinguished Speaker Series. For those of you who, uh, who attend our regularly our uh, monthly lectures, you have seen the amazing speakers who come to the museum, providing information on diverse topics ranging from California's maritime history to the rich ecosystem in the Santa Barbara Channel. So moving forward, the name Maritime Distinguished Speaker Series will be our way of further expressing the exceptional nature and quality of this uh, monthly offering. So tonight, I am pleased to welcome our very own <laughs> Dr. Gerald Jackman as the inaugural speaker uh, for our Maritime Distinguished Speaker Series, presenting Santa Barbara's Royal Presidio, Maritime Moments and More. After receiving his PhD in history from UC Santa Barbara, Dr. Jackman taught for six years in Europe and Washington, D.C. In Washington, he edited the publication The Muses Flee Hitler, which is a series of papers delivered at the Smithsonian on the intellectual exiles who escaped from Europe. He was executive director of the Santa Barbara Trust uh, his, his, for historic preservation for 28 years. That's a long time, Jerry. <laughs> where his efforts focused on rebuilding and interpreting the 18th century site of the Santa Barbara Presidio, including reconstruction of the Presidio Chapel. Dr. Jackman oversaw the Presidio site re reconstruction, ensuring that interpretations are based on extensive research, historic background information, and archeological investigations. Under Dr. Jackman's directorship, the Santa Barbara Trust acquired other important Hispanic period resources, including Casa de la Guerra, one of the most intact early California adobes, the Roshan adobe, and San Inez Mission Mills and surrounding property. And there's a fun fact Jerry tells us that during his tenure as director, the trust made over 100,000 adobe bricks. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty amazing. <laughs> now, Dr. Jackman has published and edited numerous books, including the Santa Barbara Historical Themes and Images, and a biography of Presidio Comandante Felipe Gocochia. And you're going to correct me on that pronouncing. <laughs> In 2015, he was honored as a Knight of the Royal Order of Isabella de la Católica by Spain's King Felipe VI, and was named an honorary state park ranger by the California State Park Rangers Association in 2016. In 2023, the California State Parks Commission presented him with the Gold Bear Award for his contributions to El Presidio de Santa Barbara State Historic Park. And as I mentioned before, Jerry is a current board member with our group here, provides us a lot of insight, and uh, he also has a new book. It's called Santa Barbara's Royal Presidio, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of Spain's Last Adobe Fortress which is available on Amazon and anywhere fine books are sold, as well as here tonight after the presentation. So, please join me in welcoming our inaugural Maritime Distinguished Speaker, Dr. Jerry Jackman. <laughs> Uh, really happy to do this, happy to be here tonight. And uh, I, wanna, I wanna thank uh, Jason and Heather uh, here on the staff for helping setting up the show and making it really easy for me just to come and talk. Uh, normally I would stand, but I got a diagnosis today about a pretty bad vertebrae down, down low, so we'll drive from this seating. So I think I just need to go forward. So I did do this book that came out uh, late, er, early last year, and uh, why did I do it? That was a question, you know, I was sitting around in COVID at home, and I thought, well, maybe I should write this book, and Michelle, my wife, said you should, because you spent a lot of time there, and it was really an interesting time, uh, a very interesting project to put a mud fort right in the middle of a town that had disappeared, and uh, so that was the motivation, but also, uh, I think it's a really important international site, and I want to make sure that we all appreciate that, and that's one of the reasons that I, I wrote the book. 
I dedicated the book to Harold Kirker, here in front of the chapel while it's under construction. Uh, that's Patrick O'Dowd to the left and Harold in the center, and, and me in a younger age, obviously. <laughs> uh, and Harold was a professor of cultural history with most of, most of his work on architectural history, he did it on Bullfinch's Boston, and he did a thing called California's Architectural Frontier. And it's a very interesting story that go, would go on too long of how I came to study under him, but he was always so good to me and very supportive of my work and also served on the board of the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation. So I dedicated the book to him. So the Presidio, uh, first of all, there were four Presidios in California, but there were probably around 100 adobe forts built by the Spanish. We, we tend to think of the frontier as going from east to west, but there was another frontier that went from Mexico up from south to north, and that was uh, really dotted with many Presidios along with the current uh, U.S. border all the way to Texas. and so. This Presidio was the last one that was ever built by the Spanish. Now, there are other works, other Presidios that were built later or restored during the Mexican period, which is in the 1820s, but this is the last Spanish fort. And the rendering is by uh, Russell Antonio Ruiz, and his last name is missing there. First mistake. Uh, uh, permanent, permanent construction took place on this Presidio, 1784 to 1790. And it was Commandant Overseeing Construction, Captain Felipe de Goy Cochea. Uh, by the way, that's a very common Basque name. You know that? Uh, and and uh, so if you're going to go to the Basque country, you might want to learn how to pronounce it because you'll come across <laughs> some Goy Cocheas. So it took 300,000 bricks, probably. Uh, I didn't talk to the archaeologists about the probably close to 50,000 roof tiles that had to be fired to make this Presidio. This, uh, this is some of the adobe bricks that we made at the Presidio during uh, this time period when we were doing the reconstruction. And how many do you think are there? Maybe 500? So doesn't that give you a sense of how many adobe bricks had to be made to build this fort? on the frontier. Each one of those, by the way, weigh around 50 pounds. They have to be moved several times before they end up in the buildings. So the Presidio was founded on, uh, on uh, April 21st, 1782. Father Serra, Governor Felipe de Neve, First Comandante Jose Francisco Ortega with leather jacket soldiers in the background there. And so that's how the city was founded. Serra actually came here several times before the Presidio was founded. And at, after the Presidio was found, some people don't know this, but he stayed around a month thinking there was going to be a mission which was not, was not founded until four years later, which is a very significant uh, fact in relationship with the Chumash Indians. During this time period, Charles III, or Carlos III, if you want to do the Spanish, was the king of Spain during the founding of the Presidio. I think it's kind of interesting that Prior to his reign in Spain, he was the monarch of the Kingdom of Naples and Sicily, which people don't know about. He didn't become the King of Spain until 1759. I believe he died in 1788. He started, what, what's really interesting, he started the excavations at Pompeii and Herculaneum. And uh, that was really, in a way, the first professional archaeology that was undertaken. Now, Truthfully, he was interested in, in the statues that were being uncovered at Pompeii, but, but the people that he brought in who did the excavations really were very professional. Anyway, this statue was donated to Santa Barbara in 1982 by King Juan Carlos of Spain, and today it resides at the Presidio where archaeology continues to this day, and I think the king would have liked that if he's still with us. So I thought, uh, since we're doing maritime, I would do a little aside here. Charles Fleet, leaving Naples. Note Vesuvius, see the image on the top left? Uh, here's the ships, and uh, the fleet is carrying him to, to Spain to be crowned Charles III. Charles started excavations at Pompeii, just to make sure you remember that. Uh, now, when they came here and founded the Presidio, there were Ch the Chumash Indians. I'm not gonna go into great detail on 
on the Chumash, obviously one of the more interesting Indian peoples of California, and uh, their relationship with this Presidio is not well known, but you have to remember that this is the only site in California where a Presidio preceded a mission. Father Sarah wanted to have a mission here, but they were a little nervous because there had been uh, uh, a, a riot and, and some uh, soldiers and settlers were killed at the Colorado River, so they wanted to make sure the Presidio was established first. So the, it, what's really interesting is there were this five years when the relationship was developing between the Chumash and the Presidio soldiers. And the Indians stayed primarily in their villages until about 1800, after which, about from 1800 to 1810, they started to move in large numbers into the mission. So another thing that shows the relationship between the Chumash and the Presidio was the fact that the son of Yananali, the great chieftain, we have Yananali Street, right? Uh, Yananali's son died at five years old of unknown causes and was actually buried and, and his name was given a Christian name, Juan Batista, and there he was buried in the Presidio Chapel. This is one of the only places in California where an Indian burial in the Spanish period has a marked grave. So it's a very important site, not only for, for Santa Barbara and the Chumash, but also for all of California. So this relationship, the, the Trust for Historic Preser Preservation, I, I was quite interested in this relationship and we hired a, a historian, Marie Duggan, to do research on the relationships between the Chumash Indians and, and uh, uh, the soldiers and the Padres. And it was quite interesting. There was a cert certain amount of agency with the Indians. I'm not gonna go into detail here because there isn't time tonight, but if some of you are interested, you might wanna purchase that book. I think it's still available at the Trust. And uh, it describes these relationships that were going on. And the Indians would actually negotiate their wages between the mission and the Presidio to do certain tasks. And they were, as I mentioned, a very skilled people. And uh, that story was, was heading in a particular direction. But then the Spanish Empire began to collapse. And the whole world became topsy-turvy. And uh, that relationship really didn't develop after that. Then there's the leather jacket soldiers that originated on the Spanish frontier in the 16th century and over time became mostly of mixed racial and ethnic origins. So this notion of the conquistadores, I'm not gonna get into the big discussion, was there conquest or wasn't there, but this notion of Spanish coming to Santa Barbara to conquer uh, the Indians is rather interesting when you think about the mixed group of people that the soldiers represented, European, African, Mexican, indigenous, were uh, really uh, pretty much uh, half of the soldiers were of mixed blood, as you might call it. There were mulattoes, there were people who were married uh, Indians, so Spanish, they were called Spanish, and they would marry a mestizo. There were, in, there were even Indians that were married to mulattoes, and so forth. So it's a very interesting history, and I'd say it's the first diversity uh, of California that we're so, so proud of uh, that we talk about today. But undoubtedly, uh, the impact on the Chumash was profound. Their, their world was disrupted. We know that half of, uh, half of the Chumash were taken out by disease, but uh, there were other factors as well. And livestock, you know, at the end of the Spanish period, around 1820, there, there were probably 5,000 uh, Spanish soldiers of the type that I just described to you, only a few of whom were born in Spain. You say, well, how could that small amount of people have such an impact? Well, those Spanish introduced agriculture, and they introduced uh, what, the, what you see here, horses, cattle, and especially sheep. And here, by the way, sheep is a big industry in Spain, even today, not as much as it was back in the 18th century. But do you know that there was more wealth created by the sheep industry than all the gold that came from the New World? So there was an important uh, thing that happened when the sheep came to the, to the New World, and then they came up to uh, Santa Barbara, and there were probably around... 10 to 15,000 sheep in Santa Barbara by the end of, 
uh, the Spanish period, not to mention horses, cattle, etc. That was a huge impact on the environment of the Chumash. Another kind of myth that we have is uh, the historic El Camino Real. It existed, there's no question. There, there was a trail that went, a road that went all the way down from Baja, California up to San Francisco. But the fact was that most of the, most of the transportation, most of the shipping, the people came not on trails but by, by or horseback, by, but by ship. So there is a huge maritime history uh, that's part of the Presidio history that uh, we dealt with a lot while I was at, at the Trust. F for example, we did this book. It's a publication documenting the goods ordered and sent to Alta California uh, by ship from San Blas, Mexico. And there are about 50 of these documents that survive. I don't know if any of you knew who Giorgio Perisonotto, but he was a pr professor of Spanish out at the university. He brought down with him a table of graduate students. And uh, they, they spent about a year and a half, two years translating these documents. And we learned a lot about the international trade. And does anybody here know what the number one thing that was shipped to California that more than anything else? Chocolate. <laughs> right. And it's and, and almost every one of these uh, requisitions or uh, lists of items that came, uh, chocolate is, is listed. But they did it in coffee and it was kind of a bitter taste, I, I'm told. So now that's some, some maritime history. This is not the best map in the world, uh, I, I agree. But I, I wanted to go take us to San Francisco because I said I wanted to do a little maritime history. Now if you look at this map in the bottom of it, you will see, uh, barely can see San Francisco here. Right here, okay. So this, this was an expedition that Goicochea was uh, to lead from San Francisco all the way up to uh, Bodega Bay, right? Now, this whole area north of San Francisco was terra incognito. The, the Spanish had not been there, but there was, there was this competition between the, the British, the Spanish, and the Russians for this area. So he, he was commissioned to go with to go with 12 men, counting Goicochea, 24 horses, and eight pack animals. Major unanswered question, how did the horses get across the bay to the Marin Peninsula? Were they brought by, were they harnessed and put on these, these 24 animals? Were they put on a lancha? That's a, that's a small ship that they had. It was just a boat, really. Uh, they would have had one of these, or did they swim the horses across? So, guess what? We don't know. <laughs> However, you say, oh, come on now, the horse thing, that's, that, that's not realistic. So I'd like to, I'd like to show you something. This is a, a film that dates from uh, 1937, I think. And this horse's name is Blackie, and he made a bet with somebody that... Uh, his, this, this person made a bet with somebody that his horse Blackie could swim from the Golden Gate on the, on the Marin Peninsula side to Chrissy Field is where the Presidio used to be. Here we go. So that horse is, is not only swimming, he is pulling somebody by his tail across and here he is, he did it in 20, he did it in 23 minutes. <laughs> so, um, let's see if I can get down here. Okay, so anyway, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? So it's possible, uh, it's possible I, that they brought them over one at a time on those little launch of boats. I don't know whether they really had the capability of, of putting horses on the ship like that, 
harp with harnesses because they didn't. One thing, the horses and the and the livestock came up on the trails. They didn't bring them up by ship. So, it's an unanswered question, but it's an interesting thought. So here, here you can see the the, the trip that they took, and the other interesting thing that I'd like to talk about is that Michelle and I followed the very trail of this. We went across the Golden Gate Bridge, and th there is a report that Goy Kochea did describing the various places that he went and the distances that he traveled. And uh, he went, first of all, up to Tomales Bay, and you can see it's really hard to, to, sh to use this here to show you exactly, but he, he, he went up here with the group, and they went to the end of this point here, and they found out, whoops, they're, 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 they couldn't get across to Bodega Bay, so they had to go all the way down back this way and come up here to Bodega Bay. Um, and then, after he went to Bodega Bay, he, he went up here all the way to this, there's a Salmon Creek that's up here part of the way, and then there's the Russian River up here. And a well-known amateur historian did an article uh, from the report saying that Goykochea had, had done a league is only one mile. And Michelle and I followed the trail and, and found out that no, his league was two miles. So I'm almost certain that he got himself all the way up to the Russian River. And I'm standing, that, that's the Russian River right there. And when, Goyka, when Goykochea came up, it would have been about August. Now the river flows year round because they have a reservoir up above now, and they release the water so they have the year round for for uh, recreation and so forth. But when Goy Kachea came, I'm absolutely convinced that he stood in the spot with his men and looked out and said, we ain't going any further. <laughs> uh, that, that's tough, tr uh, tough ter uh, terrain. And I think uh, he turned around from here. So I, I suggested to a few of my friends that live up there that it should really be called the Spanish River, but they, they, they don't particularly like that idea. So when, when uh, Goykochea came back, by the way, uh, this, is, this is George Vancouver. This plaque is at the Presidio in the wall, right? And it, it describes the, ex the visit of George Vancouver with Peter Puget and, and Lieutenant Whitby, fa famous names, uh, uh, who came by in their ships. And uh, what's interesting is they came by and they also stopped in Bodega Bay, and then they came and, and stayed for, what, eight or nine days in, in uh, this time frame, right after uh, Goy Kachea had come back from, from Bodega Bay. So they probably had some conversation about that. And so here's, the, here's this famous recreation of the three ships that came in. The wonderful, accurate, and if you, if you ha can't, haven't noticed it, that's the Presidio. That's the Shuktun village right in here. I think I've got it right. And there's the Presidio. And so, uh, so uh, they came ashore. And later, Goykoche is going to get in trouble. He's, you know, there, were, there was actually conflict between Spain and, and, and Britain over the northern uh, northwest coast. But the settlement did come. But he let them come ashore and reprovision their ships. And then they went to they went to dinner in his commandancia, and, and it was kind of a nice moment, and then they invited Goy Kachea back out to have dinner on the ship, which he did, but he got seasick. <laughs> so they had to take him back after a short time. He wasn't, apparently wasn't able to finish his meal. So uh, kind of an interesting story, and uh, there's a whole uh, report that was done by Vancouver on his stay here, and Menges, who was a naturalist. So that's kind of a good, there's a lot of natural history connection with the Presidio. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation. Gee, Pearl Chase. Is there anybody here that hasn't heard of Pearl Chase? <laughs> what didn't she do? So she gathered together some of the most prominent people in Santa Barbara. Of course, her brother, Harold, who had, uh, had started Hope Ranch, Yale Griffith Law Firm, Bill Luton, he owned the a TV station, but he was also uh, a direct descendant of Jose Francisco. Ortega, first commandant of the Presidio. Going down the list, these names, Francis Price Jr. was a law firm. Uh, Maynard Geiger was a famous person up at the mission that started the archive. Edwin Gledhill. I mean, she got the big names, didn't she, involved. Hollister, and then there's uh, Rube Irvin from the bank. Dwight Murphy, one of the great philanthropists. 
uh, John Ricard, who was a uh, mayor of Santa Barbara, later a judge. He's a direct descendant of, of Jose de la Guerra, or Don Jose de la Guerra, and et cetera, et cetera. And then T.M. Stork. By the way, T.M. Stork is a direct descendant of Jose or Maria uh, Ortega as well. So anyway, they, they, she got the most prominent people. They contributed something, but in my opinion, these are the people who really got the Presidio going. Uh, on your left is the Ruas family. That's, Ru uh, that's him in the, in the wheelchair, and then his son, and then the wife, Ruth. And then uh, that, those maps, the, not the maps, but the drawings that you saw were all done by him, and he did a tremendous amount of research. He was the heart and soul of the Presidio descendants that are still in Santa Barbara today. And he really was the, sort of the emotional force behind building the Presidio. The other person was Mike Hardwick, who's standing uh, with the camera. He, he did all this research on, on, on the military. He's got a book on the arms and armament, et cetera. And uh, he did some of the early archaeology, was in charge of one little excavation, even, and is a really prominent person. And then that's Richard Whitehead on the right. And Richard Whitehead was the planning director from 1945 after the war to 1969 when he retired. He fell in love with the Presidio. And he was also an engineer with a graduate degree in civil engineering from MIT. And this guy t did so much for helping us find the foundations of the Presidio by mapping, using maps and so forth. And the person down below is Jerry Haas, who did a lot of research and deeds, but also was involved with early acquisitions. These are really important people that made the Presidio go, and I really respect what they contributed. Mike, are you here? Yes, he's here. He's over there. Mike, Mike Hardwick. Thank you. There are other people, and now I can't cover all the people that were contributed to the Presidio, but Jim and Sue Higman. What, what Pearl Chase did is she gathered together people that she wanted on the board during the early years and then later on. She stayed on till her death, well, almost to her death in the, in the late 80s. Uh, and they were called Pearl's Girls, and, and Sue Higman was one of them. And uh, she and I went to Sacramento many times to promote parks, and she made major contributions to the trust. And then uh, she became ill and... and had dementia, and Jim just made sure that her wishes were followed up with donations that she wanted to make to the trust. Love these people. They were just great supporters of the trust. Here's Dr. Garvin Kusky. How did he get involved with the Presidio? Well, there was a, they were trying to put a big uh, high-rise on where Keck Park is today, and he became a staunch person opposed to it. Pearl Chase called him up and said, you're going to be on the board of the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation. And he did, and he joined. He became a huge Presidio supporter. And he was a dentist, right? And he would have in his office, he would have something on the ceiling with the, with the Presidio on it. So anytime the, the patients leaned back, they would, they would see the Presidio. And by the way, we got a lot of donations from those people, too. So that, that's sort of typical of the people that made this project go. And I don't know if some of you realize that uh, Craig McKella, uh, who's here tonight, and Cindy McKella, Cindy is the mother of Presidio descendants. And Craig on the right, of course, is a Presidio de de descendant. Three times he was president consecutive years of the trust, devoted many, many years to this and he's really important person for the Presidio project. And he's with, <laughs> and, he's, and, he's, and he's with Ignacio Coda and his significant other, Veronica. And they're, they're, he's from Baja, California, extremely successful businessman, came up and he loves the Santa Barbara Presidio and, and wants to keep, keep supporting it, keeps writing to me and so forth. So these, these are the people that had the high energy that made it go. And some of you know David Bolton. I mean, he was uh, old Spanish day presidente. Well, he started as a young man at the Presidio uh, and he did a lot of documenting with videos and so forth. He loves to cook, right? So there he is doing a pozole fest for us on the right, and that was a fundraiser. The guy did a tremendous amount of things. He's the exerciser bunny, isn't he? He's just so involved with many things. 
And then uh, we've got George and V. Oburn and, and Charles and Elizabeth Stork. And uh, the Oburns are really wonderful people, horsey people, uh, but they were so involved with the trust. She's another Pearl's girl. She admired Pearl Chase. Uh, George edited our newsletter for 10 years. She was president of the trust for two years, stayed involved. We had this uh, April 21st event and she was always organizing it and so forth. And here we are celebrating the Colombian quincentenary in 1992. And uh, the Spanish training ship Elcano is in the back uh, behind us there. And it was a, a, great, a great day for us as we did uh, that celebration. Then there's the people that just went out there and, you know, did things like this, face the foundations with stonework, and, uh, and that's the Presidio Chapel Foundations. I, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about reconstruction, but we went through various ways of rebuilding. Here you can see concrete foundations, but later on we decided that we didn't need to take out the foundations and did use pylons and save the original foundations, and I think that was a really good thing to do. And the other thing that uh, the volunteers did were provide us with these great soldiers groups that really added something to the Presidio. And it was started by Mike Hardwick, who we've already given a nice applause to, but uh, they really were very, very important in bringing living history to the Santa Barbara Presidio. So you see the breadth of what uh, these volunteers have done for the trust. And I realized I just scratched the surface. So what I decided to do, it could get kind of you could lose the feeling of the, the, the story if you just list names. So I decided to do an appendix at the end of the book. And I, if you can read some of the things, the best restoration pro projects and down the list, there's about 30,000 words and hundreds of people that are mentioned. And all you have to do is take your, your phone and to the QR code and it opens it up but it's not in, in the book itself. I think it's a, a good way. And the nice thing about it is you can, you can uh, uh, change it if the things can be added to it and so forth in, in the years ahead. And I have it on a website, so it's gonna stay there as long as I'm around at least. So that, let's talk a little bit about the Presidio and uh, the park. Here's uh, Governor Reagan. Some people have to realize that, that Reagan was a parks person, especially when he was governor. And during his time in 66 onward, the park system in California doubled in size. And he had a parks director called William Penn Mott. And this is John Hass, Jeremy Hass's father, who was friends with him. And that was really important for getting the Presidio project going. But on the other, whoops, on the other side of the aisle, uh, we, have, we work with Gary Hart and uh, Jack O'Connell. And they passed enabling legislation which allowed the trust to run the uh, park. And it's been a really win-win situation. And we did need help because things got hairy in the 80s. When people go, you're going to put this mud fort right in the middle of Santa Barbara? Uh, and you're going to close streets? That's Cannon Perdido Street and Santa Barbara Street. Well, we went through an eight-year process and other people would say things like, well, there's other things in that neighborhood. There's Chinatown and there's Japantown and so forth. And I, I felt those criticisms had some validity. And so we tried to respond to the criticism by introducing things to, to show that the park could do many different things and it just didn't have to be Spanish soldiers. And responding to that criticism, we introduced a Christmas play that had a historic uh, connection to Santa Barbara. Uh, through De La Guerra, Pablo De La Guerra, and that play started to be performed in the chapel for about 15, 20 years. There were a couple of versions of it. And we also reintroduced the Japanese community to the Presidio. Uh, the person on the far left is Valerie uh, Nishimura, and she was a, a student at UCSB, and she came and said, I'm looking for a job. And I said, well, I have a volunteer job for you. And uh, she actually organized this Nihomachi two-day event that brought about two or 3,000 people down. And since that time, uh, the Japanese and Chinese community has been well represented at the Presidio. Now, Presidio Reconstruction Project. Um, key to, to it is accurate reconstruction is archaeology and research. That document of that map is one of the most important documents in Presidio history. It's a detailed ground 
plan of the Santa Barbara Presidio. There is no ground plan around any uh, of any other Presidio that's been found with this kind of detail. It tells you what each room is used for, what the size of each room, whether it had tile or dirt floor, et cetera. It's just an unbelievable map, and it's an as-built. There were two versions of it, and this is the second version, and when the Presidio was completed, I think they were going around uh, changing some things, and then this was set off to the Viceroy, and somehow it made it back to the Newberry Library in Chicago, where it resides to this day. And that map was used to is, oh, it was used extensively to help us rebuild the Presidio. And the second thing is archaeology, and there's Richard Whitehead with volunteers, and that's the uh, southwest corner of the Presidio that they've uncovered. That's right here. Can you see it? All right. That's the area that they're looking at, the, south, the southwest corner. So the chapel reconstruction. That, now, I came aboard the Trust in 1980, and there was a lot that was, that was done before I got there, including the reconstruction of the, of the Padres quarters, which you can see in the top right, the building to the left. And uh, th we put the tile roofs on when I first arrived in, in uh, 1981. So the chapel reconstruction, here you can see it. There's the foundations, many excavations took place there. That was the final excavation before we started the reconstruction. And you can see the early phase of the reconstruction to the right up above, and then you can see down below it's nearing completion. And that's the California Conservation Corps. They actually were the group that came out and did the primary work. They made the 30,000 bricks, and in this instance we made them up at the university. and. Uh, I'm sorry, at the, at the mission, not the university. I'm stuck at the university here. Uh, anyway, they, they were a valuable asset. They not only made the bricks, but they laid the bricks. And then there, this is the interior of the chapel. That's a St. Barbara painting. That was found in the basement of Our Lady of Sorrows. And we worked with the, the, the Jesuits, and they let us take it and have it restored. And that was the original painting that hung in the chapel and it still hangs there now to this day in the reconstructed chapel. And on the right, you see the, the work by, by uh, Norman Neuerberg, the historian. By the way, Norman also was the design consultant on the Getty Villa. And the Getty Villa is based on the, the archeology span that was done by Charles III's team in Pompeii and Herculaneum, and he was involved with that. And here he is uh, now painting his design for the interior of the chapel. I've written a book on him. I'm hoping to get it published one of these days. Uh, Presidio Comandancia Project, 1992. Kenny Ruiz and Tim Aguilar, you can see in the center. And I, and I w got out there. I think I probably made a couple hundred bricks in my day. And uh, you, can see the ex see, you can see the foundations after they are exposed. Then you see the aqueduct that was uncovered during this period. Then you see the construction. And then here's the reconstructed uh, Comandancia and the chapel on the corner that you drive by these days. Now here's the northeast corner. We did it in segments because it takes, it t takes years to do the archaeology. You, you do the archaeology, then you get the reports, then you study the reports, then you, you find an architect, then you do your more research, and then you come up with a plan, then you take it to the city, then you take it to the state, then you raise the money, and it happens, and we did it. And here is the northeast corner. It's one of the bigger projects after the chapel. You can see there the foundations. At two, it's not the best image, but you can see the foundations that had been exposed. And here is the under, under construction. You can see it across the street. 25,000 adobe bricks, 10 rooms reconstructed, including a two-story tower. And we found that tower through the foundations, the thicker foundations, and on a, another map that was done in the, in the uh, early 19th century that described this tower. And this project was completed in 1998. This is one of my favorite things. So we had a fire, the Moray Fire, back in the 90s. And there were trees that were, the bark was damaged, and the trees were going to have to be cut down. So we talked to the National Forest Service. They said, well, you guys can go up and cut down trees for your project. And we found from archaeological research, especially the De La Guerra House, that white pine was used 
and it was brought down from the mountains for that adobe and likely for the Presidio. So we were actually doing what they did, but they hauled, the, the Spanish and De La Guerra hauled it down by oxen, dragging it. We had trucks, what the heck. <laughs> anyway, isn't that great though to see that? And now here, here's the wall, you know. I mean, this, this wall here is about 6,000 adobe bricks, right? And that only represented about 10% of the original defense wall that was built to give you the enormity of, of this project on the frontier. Now, here's an overview. And here, let's see if I can get this to... Hmm. Well, can you see the... Oh, there we go. Can you see this wall here? That's the same wall. So that, that wall will be continued all the way here over here, down off the map, down here. That, that represents 10% of what was actually built. And so here, here's the chapel, there's the, there's the Padres quarters, this is the Comandancia, the northeast corner, and then over here is El Cortel, which is one of the original buildings. And this is the Cunedo Adobe, and by the way, Craig McKellar is a descendant of the Canadoes, so there you go. Um, and now, the next slide I'm gonna show you, take note of this area where the defense wall was. So, all of us that have been around Santa Barbara know the Castagnolas from the fishing industry, but this is Lino Castagnola, and he was never part of the, in the fishing industry himself, but he owned a liquor store on the corner of, of Cannon Perdido and Santa Barbara Street, and he also owned a parking lot. And th that that I showed you before, the wall, was on his parking lot property. Lino moved to Ashland, Oregon, uh, and Michelle and I happened to go to the Shakespeare Festival a lot in Ashland, Oregon, and so I knocked on his door. We were renting his property, the parking lot, and I said, you know, we're interested in, if you would put us in your will to to purchase the property, we would really appreciate it. So about six or seven visits later, he was there with his CPA and said, I'm gonna give you that parking lot in my will. So he's, he's a Presidio hero, as far as I'm concerned. He was a really great guy. Then there's Tommy Chung in the Presidio area. Tommy decided to sell Jimmy's, and uh, he wanted the Trust for Historic Preservation to own it. And so he, he, they did get bids and higher bids for the trust, but he chose us to be the owner. And then we wanted, because it's inside the Presidio, to make it part of the Presidio State Park, he actually flew to, to Sacramento with me and some other trust people, and we were able to get the, the uh, state to, to uh, provide funds for its eventual ac acquisition. So he's another trust hero. And then there's the Nils. Uh, Harry and Ellen Nill, they, these are people who are, just love history to the point where they go out and buy property and preserve it. So they bought the San Inez Mission Mills, uh, which are right by the San Inez Mission across from the open field. And he offered this to the trust. He had partially restored them, and uh, he decided that he wanted us to have it. And of course, we were able to purchase it from him. And I think we purchased, I, I don't know, throw numbers out, but at around 400,000, the property was valued at 1.5 million. So he, this was another person that is a hero, and that will someday become the Mission Mill State Historic Park. Now, it's important for a couple of reasons, because it's historic mills, but it's a fulling mill right here. How many people, I can't see your hands out there, but speak up if you know what a fulling mill is. I see a lot of heads going like that. Yeah. It's really, I really wish I could see you out there. But uh, anyway, a fulling mill is, a, is for processing wool. And it goes back to Roman times. Uh, the, the Romans used to full mill. It's a, a method of tightening the fiber and getting the lanolin out of the wool. It's a major process in, in, the, wool pro, in the wool process of, of, of making wool that you, you can eventually wear or use for blankets and so forth. And uh, so that fulling mill was actually built and can be connected to that, that part of the history that a lot of people don't know about. So uh, that's another reason why we became involved up there. 
Well, the trust also owned El Paseo, and I'm wrapping this up here pretty soon. Uh, El Paseo, Casa de la Guerra, gifted to the Santa Barbara Trust in 1971 by Irene Susky Fenden, it was sold by the trust to Peter Kaufman in 1989 with a historic easement. That is, he purchased the property, but we held an easement to control how the building was restored. And it turned out to be a multi-million dollar uh, restoration project that we at the trust had, had control over in many ways. And then we retained ownership of the Casa de la Guerra, and we decided, well, let's go for it. Let's, let's restore it. We started by just one room, carefully looking at it to see what was there. Then we went to the top picture on the right. We said, let's go all the way. Let's take a look and see what was, this building was like back in the 1820s when it was built. And you can see some of the adobe bricks that are in there. Walls had been taken down, and these bricks were brought in to replace walls that had been removed. Doors and windows had been removed and changed and so forth, and we took it back to its original configuration. And some of those, those that wood beams that we cut down, here they are still being used over here. And there you see the restoration project finished on your right. Also, the trust is involved with the Alacama Theater restoration and also a new Presidio Research Center. We did a lot of stuff in the, in the, in the 80s and the, and the 90s, and, and that has now been designated a city landmark, the Alacama Theater. The Presidio Research Center is available for scholars uh, down to high school kids to come and do research. And I, I'd like to close this out by just talking about the fact that Prince Felipe made two trips to Santa Barbara, one specifically to see the Presidio. And here we are with Paul Mills. Some of you may remember him. He was the uh, art he was the director of the art museum, but he was very interested in history, and he was the one who actually worked to have the uh, statue donated. And it's now in the backyard of the Presidio, over the cemetery, and there is the prince standing there, who's a direct descendant, and wonderful. Then he came back and he held a reception for the trust in, in uh, 2013, and here he is with our soldados, right there, and I, I sneaked into the picture there. And then on the right, you can see the prince with Jim Martinez, who's telling him something that's rather humorous. And we, it was a really amazing moment to have the king, the future king, standing there saying how much he appreciated what we had done. And it emphasizes to me the importance of the Presidio project. So I got, I got lots of glory out of it, but this is the glory that people, that people at the trust made possible. I'm, I'm carrying this hat because of the fact that we had a good relationship with state parks. And by the way, why wouldn't they like the trust? We operate the park, or we, I say we, they, the trust operates the park at no ex operational expense to the state, has put in more than $5 million into the park, et cetera. So uh, why not? And then I was given, you know, David Bolt and I were both given this award and knighted by by uh, Ambassador Valari in 2016. And that to me emphasizes the importance of the Presidio project. It's a site of local state significance, the founding site of the city, introducing its first citizens whose descendants still live in Santa Barbara today. And I know we have Greg here, the Agala is here, Edith Agala is here, she's also a descendant. Uh, the last and only Spanish Presidio at Cal in California has reestablished Presidio's importance in the early history of California. It's a major uh, site with international connections with Mexico and Spain. So what's the Presidio's future? Rebuild the front gate? Well, it's the state owns the property. It can happen. Uh, maybe not now, but uh, don't think about the cathedrals of Europe that went over centuries of construction. So. The, the Presidio re reconstruction's about mm, 75 years, uh, maybe in another 20 years, we'll build some more Presidio. <laughs> I won't say we're gonna build all the Presidio and close the streets, that gets people antsy. Um, <laughs> and then why not rebuild the Asakura Hotel? That, that would uh, bring back the Japanese history, a very prominent, interesting part of the history of Santa Barbara. And that As Asakura Hotel, it just slightly, uh, its foundation is slightly on the west defense wall. It could be moved over slightly. 
I'm all, I'm all for it. Create a mudslinging, all right? 100,000 bricks made so far, 100,000 more in the years ahead. Viva el Presidio de Santa Barbara. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Can't see you out there. Can we get some lights? I've got one about water. Okay, a question about water? So, so uh, water came in, well, I assume they were dipping out of the spring that's probably located in the parking lot at, on Garden Street or the city planning building. But it came in by aqueduct at what point and from Mission Creek across town? He's asking where the water came from, and yes, the answer is yes to your where it came from. It came in an aqueduct that was then called Pedro Rosa Creek that later became Mission Creek. And uh, it came a mile, it was actually, it was running by 1783. So that water was very essential for having the adobe, you know, for making the adobe and the tiles. So that's a good question. From the mission? Yeah, well, no, I'm, I'm, no, I'm sorry. From Up Mission to Creek to the Presidio, what route would that well, be? Well, that, that was something, we did a landform study, right? And to try to, to find out where it was, if people would let us know if they had, and we went to, by the neighborhood and asked people, nobody came forward. I don't know why. Probably because they didn't want to find historic stuff on their property that might limit it or something. So, so. We have a basic idea of how it flowed down, but we don't. And now, we did trace it across the street to the Playa Azul restaurant. We found a piece of it there. And it probably went under the Freitas building, which is on, on uh, Scarillo Street. Uh, but that would have been taken away. And when would that have been? When was it done? 1783. 83. Yeah, it was the very first permanent construction of the Presidio. There was a, a, tempor a temporary fort that was built, and then they built the adobe forward around it. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm curious, where did you dig or if you dug the clay for the adobes? I remember when they were building that. Where did the clay come from? Okay, well that's a good question. Uh, it's, and remember, it's, it's not really clay. It's, it's silt, soil, it's small amounts of clay, silt, soil, etc. It's not, and there isn't a per perfect adobe. Most adobe will work, but you don't want to have too much clay. Clay is used for fire, for firing. Uh, for the Padres quarters, it came from, there used to be a general telephone parking lot on Upper State Street, and they agreed, it was very good soil, and they let us go, this is before my time, and they took that soil and brought it all the way back down to, to uh, the Presidio, and they made the bricks down at the Presidio. Now, during my time, we did get soil from uh, that parking lot, but then uh, Wells Fargo built on that parking lot. So, so uh, all the bricks for the chapel were made from soil from that parking lot up at the mission. But then we started making them down at the Presidio, and the soil came from the archaeology. About a third to half of the soil came, it was piled up, I like the idea, piling it up, right? making the adobe bricks and putting them back in the building. So that was about a third. Then we would import the soil and we would sift through it. And so about, about a third, maybe a half to two thirds was imported. And you can always buy soil. So that's what we did. Yes? Well, remember the, the Presidio was here first. Every Presidio had a chapel. I mean, because God was really important to the Spanish. And, and, um, and there wasn't, a, there wasn't a, a, a mission here till 86, and a priest that would come up from Monterey to do a mass every, every week. And that's why they had a Padres quarters. But, uh, so the church was always there and the, the mission obviously became more important as time went on, as more Indians 
uh, were, came to the missions. And uh, there was, it's a kind of a mystery, a little bit of a mystery why it all happened between 1800 and 1810. But between 1800 and 1810, every, almost every village was emptied. There was nary an Indian living in a village after 1810. And that's, if you want to know the answer to that, I would, I would talk to John Johnson, who's a, the leading authority on the Chumash in their history. Yes? I'm 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 sorry I did. I don't know. I don't. I can't answer that. But but it pr probably, yeah. I I don't know that. But but uh, pack trains were a big deal in the central part of Mexico, going from from Mexico City up to Arizona and New Mexico and Texas. They there were pack trains going all the time. And that question can easily be answered, but I can't. I'm, I mean, you could, could go online, and I'm sure you could even just Google Spanish pack trains uh, in, in North America. If anything comes up that these days, it's amazing. But I can't answer that specifically. Yes? Correct. The Padres, and did the Padres from Monterey continue to come down to the Presidio to hold services? So no, repeat the question. Okay, so, so she wanted to know what the relationship was between the mission and, and uh, the chapel here. Yes, the mission was for primarily for the Indians, and the chapel was primarily mass for the soldiers. There were weddings, and there were actually burials in the chapel, and they're almost all... Presidio soldiers and their wives. Then, the, then they went out and, and started doing burials outside the chapel. So that was primarily for the soldiers, yes. Yes. Uh, you know, the Bruruites, uh, father and son that worked on the project, were they descendants of Bernardo Bruruites that met with, met with Jonathan Seymour? I don't think so. But I don't know that for a fact, but I don't think so. She asked what, what the relationship was between Ruiz, Bernard Ruiz, and, uh, and the Ruiz is here, and I don't, I, I don't know the genealogy of that, so I, I wouldn't venture a guess. Ruiz? Efahenio Ruiz, he said. He had connections. Yeah. Right, but, but Russell was also a Goicochea descendant. Yeah, there are there are multiple Goicochea descendants here in Santa Barbara. But Goicochea was never married, by the way. But uh, uh, but uh, you know, it's it is humorous. But there was a tremendous amount of illegitimacy on the on the frontier. There's been books written on that subject by scholars, I guess. You know, yes. Maybe two more. Two more questions, if there are any. Yeah, go ahead. Woo! Wow. Did you just do that? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Told you. <laughs> Thank you for answering your own question. One more question. Say that again. That's Mike. That's Mike. Yeah. Right. So what Mike was saying is that, the, what I mentioned earlier, that the ships were where most of the supplies came to California. You know how they had to tack way out and come back in. So it was a long trip to get up from San Blas, which is south of the Baja California Peninsula. Okay, la last question. Last question. All right. <laughs> 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 T 
two, two things. All right. One of them was putting my hands in the mud. I really, I mean, it's, it, earth and, earth and, earth and stuff is really amazing. And it's still, you know, that, that uh, 10% of the population of China lives in earthen structures. I mean, it's still a major building material. So I, I just think it's got a, it's a really interesting story and it, it's got a future too, because it's, it's, something that we can be thinking about building. Not so much in California, because anything two stories in Adobe has to have a good structure, metal structure. I didn't go to the details of how we used, uh, you know, uh, concrete and steel to make sure the buildings don't fall down. But, you know, the second thing was, I think, the prince's visit. Yeah. I mean, walking him around, I walked him around to the Northeast Quarter, you know, and I'd ask him questions about history. He knew, he knew a lot about it. He knew a lot about Charles III and everything, so those two things were really pretty outstanding. I want to thank you all.